So hello and welcome to another episode of Interviews with Experts. As beekeepers, we may recognize a variety of nectar sources that our bees make honey from. In this video, you'll hopefully learn a little more about how honey sommeliers prepare themselves when sampling honey and much more. I'm Frederick Dunn and my special guest today is Jessica Locarnini. Jess joins us from Melbourne, Australia. Here's Jess. Uh, my name is Jessica Locanini. I'm currently living in Melbourne. Uh, and by day, I'm a marketing professional. By night, my superpower is I'm a honey sommelier. So that means most people, when I say that to people, they're like, that's not a thing. It really is a thing. <laughs> it's very niche, but uh, I think it's, yeah. So I, you know, it took a lot of, study a lot of practice and a lot of and eating a lot of honey to sort of start to call yourself a honey sommelier mm -hmm. so uh yeah so i um work with beekeepers and foodies on education about the flavors uh, of honey particularly the very complex and unique flavors of australian honey mm -hmm. and um yeah so i run workshops um do tasting notes and yeah so i'm i i love honey that's awesome. Well, it's good that you love it. And I'm really glad that you're here talking with me today because I reached out to you all the way back in March 16th. And here we are now, finally able to talk. So I'm so glad that you're here. And I should probably explain that the reason I invited you to talk with me, out of the blue, we don't know each other, right? No. So, no. so um, because this is an area that I've been personally interested in. And I did some studies at Cornell that dealt with uh, honey flavors and mouth taste, mouth feel. These were part of a study that I read that was part of a paper I wrote on something called the flow hive. Uh, it was a master beekeeper's critique of the flow hive. So this is my path to you. Uh, what happened was uh, they broke down the fact that there was superior mouth feel. These are things that a lot of beekeepers don't think about and people that buy honey don't think about. Um, and the idea of bringing in experts to taste test something to kind of validate that it might be a better process for harvesting honey as compared to conventional methods. And so I came across your name and you had basically the article that I was looking at, you had just graduated from a school in Italy. And uh, so I reached out and I, did I find you on Facebook? How did I find you? Was that you Facebook? Found me. Uh, yeah, I think you did. You found me on Facebook, but okay. um, yeah, because I just finished my um, advanced training in Bologna in Italy. Advanced training. So, all right, now I'm going to lead you through a lot of this because I have a couple of notes. So, and keep in mind that our viewing audience uh, may have never even heard this. I'm going to say it. Sommelier. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So those of you who are watching should probably say that out loud right now so it embeds into your mind. And so you can blow your friends' minds later when you realize that not all honey tastes the same. Uh, we know the extremes, like here in the United States, we have like buckwheat honey. It's real robust, really strong, strong flavors and smells. Um, but you're a true, you would be the equivalent of like the nose at a perfumery or uh, somebody who tastes wine and knows exactly what barrel that was taken from and things like that. Am I far yeah. off the mark? No, that's it. That's exactly it. That. Okay. I mean, if, and so um, give us an idea of how big a field this is, like how many people go through, for example, what you did there in Italy is like, how many sommeliers are we making every year specifically with honey? Uh, I, I don't know globally, um, but it was interesting because um, when I got my first, my foundation training actually in the US um, a few years back, uh, I there was a lot of interest in what I did and um, people would ask me, are you Australia's only honey sommelier? Yeah. And I was like, I was like, I doubt it because I'm sure there's other people that have done this. I was just sort of, and I didn't actually re sort of, I, I couldn't work it out. Um, but I asked that question directly when I went to Italy and I said to, um, because the guys that train at Raffaele and Gianluigi, they, um, they train everybody. 
So they would know. I was like, how many people have gone through this advanced training from Australia? And they said, to date, only about six to eight. Six to eight throughout the existence of that school? Yeah. Okay. And that's for for Australia. So, um, but the people that have done it previously, um, I don't believe they did anything um, well, I'm, I haven't seen anybody who else who's doing what I'm doing in this country. Mm-hmm. But obviously, you have um, in the US, you've got Marina Marchese from the, Austra- um, the American Honey Tasting Society. Um, there is a um, there's um, Lion Raw Honey, Natasha Lion, who she's a honey sommelier in Johannesburg and does amazing things with some really unique African honeys. Uh, and um, there's uh, also the London Honey Sommelier. Um, there's Paula and Sarah in the, in the UK. So uh, mm-hmm. they both are doing a lot of work with sensory analysis of honey over there. Over there. So there's sensory a few analysis. Yes, that's that's the that's the sort of more scientific description of a honey sommelier. So you um, you do you you take a honey and similar to wine, um, I actually studied um, wine tasting as well, mm-hmm. just to understand the to compare the two. So I got my certificate one in WSET, um, wine and spirit tasting. Mm. And I thought, because everyone was asking me, they're going, is it the same as wine tasting? And I said, well, I'll find out. So um, it is very, very similar in a sense that you will have a wine glass, you put the honey in, um, you, you do, it's a sensory analysis. You, you use all your senses, sight, taste, feel, um, you know, smell, all, all of that to, to really assess the characteristics of that honey, similar to wine. Yes. Did you do all the senses? I think you how many senses did you just use? I use well when you when you do honey tasting you do sight, feel like sight, smell, taste, feel. I was gonna say I'm still I haven't had a coffee yet. I'm just That's okay. I'm still just rolled out of bed. I'm trying to remember. That's okay. So, uh, all of them. Just just say all. All of your them. senses. Yeah, yeah. So is there? So you don't. There's no sixth sense. There's not. There's no spiritual uh, unless, feeling. Unless you have um, a, a gut feel of what that. <laughs> you have an intuition. Be. You have an intuition, yeah. maybe, about the wine. Yeah, so the five senses. So this is really good stuff. And you also mentioned the American Honey Tasting Society that yes. other people would be interested in too, because your area of expertise is primarily now Australian floral sources, right? Yeah. Um, and did you well, graduate? I'm just going to take a guess. Did you graduate or get that certificate from the American Society in 2019? Yes. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know. good. Wild <laughs> guess out of the blue. It wasn't even right here in my notes. I just totally, I just reached out with one of my senses and figured that out. You've got the so, same sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you were doing wine first. What no, I did in- honey. I did honey first. Oh. So then what, what inspired you? Let's, what inspired you to pursue honey on that level and become an expert on honey? Uh, I've always been into bees and I've always, um, you know, and, I, and I've, I've done beekeeping training and um, it, it wasn't until I worked, I worked for a while, actually interesting you mentioned Flow Hive. Um, I worked for the guys at Flow Hive for a little while. Oh, you did? And that, yeah, I did. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so what did you do for them? Marketing. Oh, so for all the people that can't get a fly because they're too expensive, we found the person. No, <laughs> no, that was that was a long time ago. Lame that was before, Jess. No, that was before I even did my first course with Honey um, Sensory. Okay. Um, oh, that's in, cool. In the- that's interesting yeah, so, because, yeah. yeah. Let's touch on so, that for a minute. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, cool. um, they were kind of blown away by their Indiegogo campaign success. They made a whole pile of money and Cedar had no idea that he was going to have to organize a business. I think he wanted like $70,000 or something. Um, so then that blew up. Did, and so did you help them structure their business or what, what was your part? No, I was only there for a short time. Um um, I was only there for, I mean, I actually lived in Melbourne and I traveled up for, for the job, but um, I was trying to continue to live my life in Melbourne. So I ended up um, coming back home, but uh, 
I was there after that sort of the business had started humming along. But just like I said, I was only there for about a year and a half, I think, if that, or only a year. Oh. But yeah, only a short time. So you you but didn't like time. the you didn't like the people and had to get out of there. No, <laughs> nothing at all like that. Okay. Nothing at all like that. Um, I missed my I missed my boyfriend back home. So oh, your boyfriend. Is, yeah. Oh, now, wait a second. So how long ago your boyfriend? Are you married now? Ah, uh, no. It, it's now an old boyfriend. I should have stayed. <laughs> okay. All right. Not to get too personal, I just wondered because I read some, I read somewhere that you had gotten married in Las Vegas. Yeah, but, I did. Yeah, I did. again, it's totally a random thing. I just wondered if you might have been married in Las Vegas at some point in your life. Uh, yes, yes, I actually I was, and then I renewed my vows in Vegas. So um, okay, yeah, so America has a very special place in my heart, literally. <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay, so this is the same guy, this your boyfriend, different guy. Oops, I sorry. See. Okay. No, it's right. <laughs> All right. We'll move on. All right. <laughs> so a different guy, but he's good. Does he like honeybees? Uh so yeah, the new guy um does definitely like honeybees. Yes. Okay. That's good. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't be with him if he didn't. I'd be like, no, is that's that's part of the criteria. Like thank you. Okay. Are you good. With bees? If not, there's the door. Now, do you like let a bee sting him just to see if he'll hold his ground or run away or? Do you know what? It was interesting because um, if we're at a cafe and there's a bee around or anything and I and I watch and it's like, yeah, if they're, if he's all like like that, it's like. Yeah, that's it. But if he, no, if he lets it land on him, if, if he lets her land on him or like, you know, going, yeah, that's cool. But none of it, none of this. Okay. I like your I like your screening process. That's that's very good. Okay, so back on track now. You decide that you have to know what honey really tastes like. You have to know more about how to assess yeah. honey. The reason why is I um I'm I'm a bit like you. I'm a bit of a you know global nomad. I, I spent some time, I lived in Dubai for a few years, London for 15 years. Um, came back to Australia and lived in Melbourne, then went up to, you know, near Byron Bay. And I'm actually originally from Queensland. So in my travels and with my interest in bees, obviously honey was front and centre. And then what I started to notice and what I, what, I, what I learned about was I started to really notice the differences and the variances and the taste. And, you know, your mind starts to go, oh, that's cool. But then you don't think about it again. Mm -hmm. And then when I really sort of started to um, work more closely with honey and bees, then you find out about um, the reasons why. And I also discovered the American Honey Tasting Society and honey sommeliers. So it really sparked my interest and I was a bit obsessed for a while. So um, I went to the US to do the foundation course. Can we in, pause? Yeah. You're obsessed. What does that mean? Well, I you were obsessed for a while. Did you just like, did you Google everything? Did you track people down? Did you? I, I just, I, I just was trying to like obsessed in the sense that I would, I started my honey collection and it was getting ridiculous. I had crates and crates and crates of honey and I'd like, you know, was really sort of starting to eat them and think about it. like, you know, I'd put, and I'd start to get into pairing. So, you know, um, I put honey on cheese, but then I put a different honey on a different cheese. And, you know, I got really excited about that because, you know, I'm not a chef, but I'm definitely a passionate foodie. So, oh. but, yeah. Oh, go ahead. So I'm listening. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was more of a, more of a um, overactive curiosity than yeah. an obsession. But um, when I found out about Marina's course and it just coincided that, I was going to the US to visit family, I decided to, to go and, and do the course. And then that was it. I was <laughs> sold. I was like, oh my God, this is this whole world of like, you know, this is how you do it. And then when when you've got those skills and you you are able to break it down and you and you appreciate and you celebrate how the honey has come about with the foraging of bees through certain um flowers or you know obviously honeydews you know from mm. foraging on you know aphid 
sort of excrement. But you know, there's there's different. Do you like different do you like honeydew honey? I do. I do. It, does it, it have a smoky sm a smoky flavor? Um, it is. It is smoky. It's a little bit metallic, and um, you get a little bit of a dusty dustiness through. But um, it's a dustiness. Uh, That's the first time I've heard dustiness in a flavor description. Do you know what? There's no wrong flavor description. That's, that's interesting. No, and this is, you're doing exactly what I was hoping you would do. Yeah. <laughs> in, no, I mean, introduce us to a way of describing honey um, other than, oh, that tastes good, you know? Um, all these levels and, and, you know, intricacies of the honey that come across your palate and how to even figure that out. Did that like blow your mind a little bit? That did you really like key up your ability to really taste what you're tasting and i mean are there breathing exercises what's how do you prepare to taste honey well you prepare to taste honey honey by not eating a curry immediately before <laughs> you really or wearing perfume um you know it, it's like you really want if you're an artist which you'll appreciate you want um, a beautiful blank canvas or piece of paper and you want everything there that you need and you'll you know you just you just want to set that scene so when you do honey tasting your canvas is is your mouth and your you know your senses so you just want to keep them as as you know ready and clean as possible so obviously just be mindful about what you're eating whether you're brushing you've brushed your teeth um, whether you're using strong deodorant or cologne um, just, you know, even to the point of the room that you're in, if there's distractions or noise, um, it's just always like, you know, you are like, you know, take your, taking your time with a honey and trying to take in everything that it's, it's, it's all its characteristics and, and what it's representing. So, um, but if you're doing a lot of honey tasting, similar to perfume, Mm -hmm. if you're doing uh if you're in you know if you go in and, and smell a lot of fragrances they do um between each fragrance to reset your um senses you'll have the little bowl of coffee beans which you know if, it, if it's a fancy place you do that coffee, but, but you don't coffee beans but you don't with honey with with fragrance and perfume they reset their senses with coffee beans what i did not okay yeah <laughs> No, so, that's interesting. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. So that's your um, that's like a reset. You kind of shut down what you've been smelling and that coffee yeah. beans, but this does not apply to honey. No, but okay. um it, we have a similar thing. So um with honey, um the reset, because obviously if you're doing fragrance um analysis, it's all about sort of the nose. Mm -hmm. Um that sort of and that's why the coffee beans sort of really sort of Bring you back like back in the room okay now what are you smelling next um but with honey um because it's very much about your palate as well as your nose um if it's you use green apple so green apple you have green apple slices um so if you're doing honey to honey to honey to honey to honey so they don't all start to taste the same hmm. um have some water to really clean your palate um and um that palate cleanser just a fresh green apple just munch on it, sliced up between each honeys, and it does a similar role to what you would do with the fragrance testing in the coffee beans. Now, someone's going to ask, here in the US, that would be like a Granny Smith apple. Yes. Is that what it is? Yeah, it's called Granny Smith here too. Ah, well, guess I know stuff. So, know. <laughs> uh, no, so that's actually the apple resets your palate. Yes. Okay. Um, and and with honey tasting, um, you do still use your nose, but not to the extent of fragrance. And interestingly, the reset for your nose, if you're smelling a lot of honey, is just to smell yourself. You know, so, yeah, so <laughs> in Italy, you had this whole room, like this whole panel of people eating yeah. apples, smelling their arms, just going. What? Like, yeah. So wait, is that what you saw when you first like went there? to the school you, um, saw, well, you saw a bunch of people that were actively classifying honeys and things like that and sniffing themselves and eating apples yeah <laughs> and eating that's there's a great story here in this okay so and they of course have been instructed to stay natural 
Yeah, yeah. Naturally, it's, it's, naturally in Italian is without the benefit of clothing. So yes, yeah. like when you go to the beach, nat al naturale. But um, so they would not. OK, so I have to ask this question. What about people that have body odor? I mean, uh, you know what I mean? They're not going to use their deodorant or anything else. Does that disqualify them? Like they can't be a sommelier? No, I think for the, for themselves. I mean, like, um, isn't that the? I don't know what the saying is, but something about you can't. Something about you can't smell yourself. Like, so to them, them resetting, smelling themselves, even though it might be unpleasant to somebody oh, else. Okay. Them, normal. So you're not. Okay. You're not so they're they're nose they're nose blind to themselves. Quite, quite well. You. You'd think so. Well, unless it's really bad, but that's that's not the norm. That's the exception. <laughs> that's yes, yes. The so okay. I haven't come across a particularly stinky honey are, there. are they spaced uh, well apart from one another? No, no, we don't need no? to be. Um, it's it's right literally um, we were we were in a like U shaped sort of table, all facing um, Jean Luigi and Raffaele, and we're literally just. Sitting, we had little flags because we're all from different countries. Okay. Um, you know, I had someone from Pittsburgh to one side, someone from Brazil the other. There was Johannesburg, Greece, Cyprus. So we were all there um, picking up our skills, but um, literally just as if you were in a school school room. You know, you had a desk with all of your honeys and your apple and your notes, and you know, working furiously. Okay, so um, well, I have to ask this also, when you're tasting honey, it's in its liquid state, I'm guessing. No. Uh-oh. No. So, <laughs> so, so for those that are listening, there's a lot of backyard beekeepers here. Um, give us the states that you might encounter honey, you know, when you're tasting or sampling it, because we know there's comb honey, there's creamed honey, there's set honey, which is crystallized, and of course, liquid. Um, can you run that down a little bit for us? Yeah, well, with um, with honey sommeliers, when we, we do our training, um, we don't tend to go towards um, honeycomb or creamed honey, mm -hmm. or um, it, it's really the um, set, as you say, the crystallized honey or um, runny honey, like the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more sort of fluid. Mm -hmm. And what they'll do is they'll... Um, when we get tested, we get tested on Italian honey, no matter where we're from. Um, and even in the US, we were tested on Italian honey. Oh, really? Why, yeah. Yeah. So the and American the Honey Tasting Society trains you on Italian honey? Yes. Now, there's a there's a reason. Okay. 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 So the reason, I oh, know, uh, but we did also a lot of... Um, on the side, we did do a lot of experiences with American honeys and I brought some from Australia and mm -hmm. um, we went deep with our own honeys. But um, the reason why is um, Italy is at the forefront of um, categorizing the characteristics of different honeys. And so the honeys that you're trained on, um, you're learning to recognize those unique characteristics. But what they do is they'll put it under a microscope and it'll be certified honey. So the honey, um, they've checked the pollen, they know where it's from. Mm -hmm. They can um, sort of rubber stamp it that it's definitely an acacia or a thistle or, um, you know, like a honeydew. Like there is a, there is a guarantee that the honey that you're assessing is of that origin and um, in terms of uh, the botanical origin, but also um, the geographical origin. Mm -hmm. They'll know exactly where it is. And they've also got um, a lot more detail um, and they've done a lot more work around going deep on those classifications. So for example, um, you know, a, an Italian, Italian acacia is, um, has to show, um, um, has to be in, in a different color band. If it's not a different color band, um, you know, when you're doing the assessment, it, there's a risk that's like, well, it, it's not true to an Italian acacia honey, but honey color. Um, and when you taste it, it has to have notes of vanilla and, you know, those marshmallow notes. And if it doesn't have those, then it's not true to an Italian acacia. And they can guarantee that it's you not picking it up. It's not that the honey is tainted because they've stamped it, that this is definitely of mm. that origin. Mm. 
do they throw wild cards at you um like <laughs> commercial, commercial honey just to see if you'll pretend you're tasting something that's not there uh, they do throw wild cards at us um, in a sense that we will have, it's really, I mean, I, I loved it. And I, you know, I mean, you, you do the traditional, you're looking at a honey, um, you're making it, you know, you're judging it on all the different things that, you know, um, but they want to take out certain senses to see if you can pick it up. So we do blind tasting in a sense that we will get honeys that are in black jars or to your point, we'll get a honey mm. that we've initially tested in its fluid form and they'll give it to us crystallized. And we still have to recognize that it's that honey, even though it's in a different mm. form. Um, but they also, in the advanced class we did, and, and I thought this wasn't fair because um, all of the students from all different countries were all, got um so for example when you learn about honey um the traditional way in this in europe or the states um you, there's a variety called eucalyptus mm -hmm. so in australia we've got hundreds of varieties of eucalyptus so eucalyptus to me um. doesn't, doesn't mean anything um you know is it a, a you know is it a, a red gum is it a southern blue is it an alpine ash is it, you know, what, what, which eucalyptus is it? So um, they did, uh, they did a test, which I was the only one that passed in Italy, because what they did is they, um, they also do some blends to try and mimic the flavor of a, of a eucalyptus. And mm. then they'll put only one of those honeys is true eucalyptus. Um, and all the other students were, had picked one of the other honeys. And I'm like, none of those like they're just, you know, and, and yeah. And so, because I've tasted so many eucalyptus and that's sort of my, where I've been practicing more. Um, I was the only one that was able to pick that honey out, which was, which, yeah, which was really interesting. What, what did you do to prepare for that school um, before you went there? Um, I mean, the, you had to have done the foundation training. Um, so and again, because the honeys that they use were not my local honey, mm -hmm. um, it was really turning up, um, you know, you, you do warm ups and you do refreshes of what you've learned in the foundation course. And, um, and then you go through to sort of the deeper, sort of picking out those characteristics. And, but again, they're very set schedule of honeys that they do for the training. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the skills that you pick up can be applied to other honey. So for example, um, I work with some beekeepers here in Australia on doing tasting notes for their honey, which didn't even factor into the, the training in um, overseas. So um, one of them is, um, and we've got, yeah, so so it's literally just, just trying to hone those skills. So until you're there, and if you don't have that honey, you, you sort of just have to turn up and just, and, and all I was doing was just tasting my own honey and just trying to sort of hone in on my skills, like mm -hmm. trying to, how would, I how would I describe the visual? How would I describe the smell? How would I describe, and just do as many honeys as possible, but you can't really do, you can't really sort of train as if you would for a traditional exam, unless you had those honeys there and, and I didn't have right. them. So. Yeah, so it's not something you would be taking through correspondence because you have to physically have these materials in front of you. And let me ask, does the temperature of the honey matter? Like, is it all ambient? What's the, I mean, is it warm? Is it cool? Is it chilled? Is it? I've, I've been asked that before. And um, I don't think it matters in a sense that uh, the character, the the characteristics are the characteristics. I mean, if you'd warmed it, maybe it might the the smell and the aromatics might might come up stronger. Mm. Um, but as I mentioned, like um, if you have an orange blossom honey that's crystallized and an orange blossom honey that's runny, it will still have the same characteristics. So it doesn't matter. Um, some some you know obviously the color will be slightly different if it's crystallized. It'll be lighter. So it's hard to do the identification in that right. sense because mm -hmm. you know you, you obviously looking at it in the spectrum and the, the colors is slightly changes, but that's mm -hmm. that's a natural, that's not a defect. That's it's it's naturally changing because it's changing state. 
Um, but with the the temperature, um, yeah, it 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 doesn't factor in maybe to how it would with some some other sort of I don't know whiskey or coffee or if you mm -hmm. did any sort of other sort of tastings. But um, yeah, no honey. I mean, I've never tried to taste warm like warm honey. <laughs> But right. honey, if it's room temperature or if it's cool, doesn't really. Yeah, I didn't. Into. I didn't know if it all had to be at. Of course, I don't know Celsius, but if it was all at like sixty-five yeah. degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> um, so, what is mouth feel? Uh, when I was reading this published paper from Melbourne, uh, when they did the studies of the flow hive honey, they talked about mouth feel. Uh, it had superior mouth feel. What does that mean? Well, again, I haven't read that article, but it, it, okay. it could be one of two things. So if they're talking about the, the honey sommelier, like the tasting, um, you talk about texture and it would be, um, and I, I would say that wouldn't apply for flow hive honey because flow hive honey tends to, the way that it's harvested, be in a fluid form. Like you would not get crystallized honey out of a, out of a flow hive because- Until later, yeah. And until until after it's been yeah so mm -hmm. if it if it's coming directly from the the hive um, normally we talk about mouthful in in terms of the the size of the crystals or um, you know some is more like a cat's tongue some is more like you know you know that that bigger crystals you know or some just dissolves and is smooth and will dissolve straight in your mouth um, I don't know much about um, mouthfeel of flow hive honey specifically but um sometimes that we pick up are things like um we talk about the trigeminals so it could be does it feel spicy or does it feel um uh you know things that are not a taste but is a feel like if you had um chili or if you had um mint or something mm -hmm. like that there's there's other things that you feel in your mouth that is not a flavor but it's a mm -hmm. it's a it's a sensation that you would get from um, and we, we sometimes get that with um, extra sweet honey. So if you have um, Italian acacia is a really good example. So Italian acacia has a particularly high um, sugar, sugar content, like it's, it's particularly high in, in sugar. So um, when you have something really sweet, you almost like get um, a persistent feel in your mouth that sort of like, you know, it's, it's not a flavor, but it's um, so when from the sommelier world, when we talk about mouthful, sometimes it's the persistence. So if it's a really sweet honey, you might have a stronger persistence or if, it, if it's really bitter honey, um, like a, a strawberry tree arbutus, um, you know, it's a really strong persistence so, or, or even um, as the flavor evolves, um, it might start off as something sweet like um, like sort of banana bread or banana cake and and then mm. it sort of like evolves into something a little bit more bitter so um mm. yeah so we tend to talk about things that are going on in your mouth above and beyond the initial taste or flavor so when you say it evolves this is are you actively moving it around your mouth or is this just something that's happening based on the time that it remains on your tongue um it's to do with the characteristics of the honey um well, There's for example, uh, people, you know, when they're sampling wine or whatever, they swish it around their mouth and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> what is, like, do you let honey drip onto your tongue? Do you lick it off of the spoon or whatever the delivery thing is? What's the method for putting it on your tongue? And then how does it travel through your mouth? So you would um, get a spoon you'd have your glass or your jar of honey. Um, the main thing when you, before you put it into your mouth is make sure that you have um, enough saliva because the saliva mixing with the honey is what really sort of brings out those strengths of flavors. Okay. Uh, you would literally, as you would, if it was, you were eating it for enjoyment, you'd, you'd pick up the, the honey, you'd put it in your mouth and then you would, you would sort of squash it around in your mouth I'm trying to like do the actions and not, and yeah. try and get you to squash around in your mouth um because honey tasting is not just about your mouth and and um i think the, the nose in the olfactory bulb um in your head does actually does most of the legwork i mean when you contact me march i just come back from europe and 
um, I came back with uh, some excess baggage of COVID. <laughs> so when right. I came back. Oh, you could have um, lost your sense of smell or your I sense did. of taste. You did? I did. Yeah. That's and terrifying. <laughs> yeah, but for, for a sommelier it is. Um, but yeah, but to, it, it was interesting because you talk about the, the, the there's flavor in this taste. So um, when, when you do descriptors of honey or wine or whatever it is, you're describing what you, you know, you're describing a taste, but you're really sort of going deep into the flavor. And that's the hard work is being done by your nose. And even when you put that honey in your mouth with the spoon, you're wanting to get vapors sort of travel up your internal workings to your nose. Okay. So okay. even if it's with your mouth start to go like, like, you know, like make sort of, you know, your mum wouldn't be proud because you're opening your mouth while you've got food in it. But, you know, you do that sort of like tapping um, mm -hmm. just to get the vapors reaching your brain um, and, and trying to send messages about what they can taste and what they can feel. Um, but when I came back with COVID, <laughs> One, I was very nervous because this is very important to me. Um, but it was the first time I've in my life, even when you've got a cold, you can smell a little bit. The first time in my life I'd had no smell at all um, to the point where I was scratching lemons and trying to smell them and trying to like uh, come back, come back. But um, yeah. I'd put things in my mouth and um, or I'd taste a soup. And I couldn't taste the flavor, but I kept adding salt because I couldn't recognize anything. But I noticed my tongue, I was getting sensations on my tongue of saltiness, but without tasting the saltiness. And that was mm. really weird. Or I'd eat something sweet and I, I couldn't taste the flavor, but I could taste something. I could feel something. So obviously my sense of taste was coming back faster than my sense of smell. Um, and it was, yeah, it was... It was weird, but also um, really insightful to sort of when you remove different senses, how how those other ones are actually reacting to what's going on in your body and what you're putting in your mouth. Mm -hmm. So are you back to 100% or are you yes. where you were before? You are. Oh, that's good news. Yes. Because there the <laughs> there's the long haulers that have, you know, just just some impact that carries out through months and months. So yeah. I'm so glad that you're you're back to Thank 100%. You. And is there a difference between taste and flavor? Yes. So yeah. what what so, is that difference? Well, so taste is where you um, so yeah, so taste is like literally like salty, bitter, sweet. Like you can detect what um, you know, you can detect that you know what's where it sits sort of in in the taste profile on your tongue flavor actually comes from your nose you pick up flavor through your nose so it's, hmm. it's that's why smell is so important like oh so yeah you, okay yeah I'm so sorry, when you, when you've got a, <laughs> yeah so when you've got a cold or when you've um when you can't smell anything or if you're if a good so another thing that we do with the test tasting sometimes we'll um, we'll literally we'll get some honey, put it in our mouth and hold our nose um, and then put it in our mouth and then let let go of our nose just to get that burst. All of a sudden you get that sort of, again, once you open your nose again, you nothing is distracting you from before you put it in, but you're getting that coming up through the, through the back of your, your throat, through into your nose. Okay. That's interesting. <laughs> do do <laughs> some people, yeah, yeah. do their nostrils stay stuck and they need help? So, no, maybe maybe it's the person that you talk about before that was a bit, <laughs> body, had issues with body odor. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, darn, I totally forgot. There was something else I was going to ask about that process in there. Well, maybe it'll come to me later. So you don't, do you even like comb honey? Person? Yeah, I do. I do, I do. I, I love comb honey, um, but I like comb honey for its uh, for pairing with cheese. So in a particular, okay, your perfect combination of honey and cheese is what? I like a really fresh burrata cheese, so very mild, very like delicate, mm -hmm. and I really like with it a nice floral honey but, but delicate floral honey like an orange blossom if you drizzle orange blossom on burrata it is just it's just very 
it's it's beautiful it's just a really sort of I think because they're so when you do pairings that you look at um competing characteristics so that's a really good example where burrata is so soft and mild and um you know it's it's just it's you know it's it's just sort of just very simple mm -hmm. same with uh, an orange blossom it's very it's very delicate honey um but it also has some really sort of beautiful characteristics you don't want overpowered so mm -hmm. when you put those two together you can naturally enjoy it brings a creaminess to the orange blossom honey which is just a really nice combination however um sometimes it's really good to sort of mix up uh so i really like some strong blue cheeses with maybe something a bit um malty and a bit smooth like a banksia so again it's it's just more of that caramel notes on a it's the, and then you get sort of the saltiness of the blue they're really nice together hmm. but for the americans one of my favorites is buckwheat honey mm -hmm. on um blue cheese or like even a gorgonzola or something so um because buckwheat honey reminds me of um it's got those like um it reminds me of black forest cake <laughs> really yeah it's like a it's like a, a cherry chocolate like american buckwheat honey i think is just like eating a black forest gato that's really? that's what i that's what i get from it but but tasting is very subjective so yeah yeah yeah, it's 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 because your olfactory goal, as we spoke about before, is really closely linked to learning and memory and um, emotions. So when you taste something, what it reminds me, because um, that's the part of your brain that's doing all the work, what mm -hmm. the memories that it brings to me may be different sure. to somebody else. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, it could be a bad memory for them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's it. And you're right. Uh, certain smells and, and flavors and things take you right back to your childhood the first time you smelled or tasted uh, something like that. That's really, this goes really deep. Now, the other thing is, do you do consulting like with chefs and specialists and things like that? Or yeah, it's I've, almost um, like you would be advising someone on some very high end uh, culinary experiences. Well, I've actually, there's um, just recently, um, there's a big uh, um, dairy here in Melbourne that's gotten in touch and wants to do um, some collaboration on some pairing with their cheeses. Mm -hmm. So um, I've got a meeting with them coming up um, over the next sort of few weeks. I'm just trying to nail down a, a time for that. Mm -hmm. um, I also do a lot of... Um, sort of master classes with foodies so um the melbourne farmers market here last year um don't know whether you've heard but we had a big election recently so world b day sort of didn't get a look <laughs> as much sadly okay. however um uh last year um there was a lot of attention around world b day and a lot of people were really excited and obviously we in melbourne would just come out of a very long lockdown so everyone wanted to do some fun things yeah um, so I had a, I, I, it sold out. I had a really great group um, of specifically foodies linked to the farmers markets here um, that came, and they were cafe owners and um, wine sommeliers, and you know just general people interested in that. Um, most of the work I do is with um, beekeepers at the moment uh, to do tasting notes for their honeys before they go into you know put them online because mm. i think i think that has really sort of if we talk about you know lockdowns and not being able to do physical tastings like for markets for, for beekeepers and things like that mm -hmm. i think the importance so i always when i talk to people particularly beekeepers i was like why is honey tasting important to you yeah. and mm -hmm. because honey tasting sounds a bit Ooh, you know, I'm going to get a wine and it's a bit of a novelty and it's, it's actually not about that. It's about um, evolving the conversation with your distributors or your stockists or your customers. Um, one, to start to differentiate your honey and, and, and try and describe what to expect versus to your point earlier over, it's really good. It's caramel. It's like sweet. It's, you know, you know, it's more interesting to go into. This is very malty you know, um, has notes of banana bread, but then evolves into something, you know, it's, or, or this, is, and also this is how you would use it. Um, 
but a lot of people haven't been able to get out or a lot of people are doing a lot more shopping online a lot of um, smaller beekeepers have been pushed towards having to go digital and sell their products in an online environment so how do right. they where they used to just have jars lined up and get people to taste and pick the ones they like how do they then position their honey um, in a digital world so I think trying to recognize those notes and get people excited about honey through the words that you use mm -hmm. to describe them is, is I think really important. Yeah, uh, the ability to describe honey other than something sweet and tastes good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a, no, it's extremely valuable. And that's why it's an, an interest area for me now because there's so much more to it and we're kind of missing out on that. And I just wanna backtrack a minute the, when you're putting the honey on the cheese and that's it, it's not like on bread or anything else, it's standalone? No, I mean, you, I mean, I, it, it depends. I mean, um, I think people should really have fun with it. Uh, like I mentioned, it's, there's no rules. And I think um, being a honey sommelier is a lot more fun than sort of being a traditional wine sommelier because it is such a young industry and, and honey is, you know, sort of starting to have its moment like whiskey did or gin did where people um, used to go and just, you know, now that they, they know what gin they like and they'll say, I want that one um, because I know the flavors and I know that's what, what I'm a fan of. And um, here in Australia, um, more people, I mean, I went, I was really excited in a supermarket. They had um, one of the dairies had Ironbark honey um, yogurt on for sale in a, in a supermarket. <laughs> And I, I was like, they're getting it. They're I don't even using... know what that is. I have no idea. What it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a eucalyptus. It's called, it's, oh, it's eucalyptus? Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a variant of eucalyptus. It's called ironbark. So ironbark is more of a... So um... that's, what, that's what these trees say to you after you prune them? They say eucalyptus? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Are you a dad? Because that sounds like a dad joke to me. I'm a grandfather. <laughs> Green. I have green. Oh, okay, you've got an excuse. You can use as many That's of those good. jokes as you can, and I'll always laugh. <laughs> so it's iron bark, you said. Yeah, iron bark honey. Um, so the but the the why I got particularly excited. Well, one iron bark's a beautiful honey. It's um it's like buttered popcorn sort of like that's the way we you know it, some of its key characteristics, but it's a it's a variant of it's it's a eucalyptus variety. And um but they'd had in you know our equivalent of where do you Walmart is that where you you know where do you do where's, where's a big grocery store what in America I don't know what I what I don't leave my yard so I don't even know what's right. <laughs> but it's the equivalent people go to Aldi's and uh, you know Walmart super centers or whatever they are so it's the equivalent of someone going in there and buying like not just in the honey aisle, but the but they've started to use the 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 variant of honey as a marketing thing. So it's like this is okay. not just honey yogurt, this is iron bark honey yogurt. Right. So I, okay. Yeah, I got particularly excited. And you know, within the last three weeks, I've been contacted by people in marketing about that very thing. And uh because of the online market and the need to recruit experts to validate different honey lines. Mm. Because people just, let's be honest, we can't trust the market. Uh, the standard consumer has no idea if that's even real honey other than looking at the price and seeing that you're getting a pint for $5, probably not honey. Yeah. Um, so informing the public on even, that's tough. Uh, because the usual, the normal consumer, unless they're meeting the beekeeper and seeing the bees, uh, they don't have any idea other than, you know, they go to the Whole Foods co-op and they assume that it's Whole Foods, that they know the beekeeper and this is raw honey and things like that, but it's all being meddled with so heavily yeah. that uh, there's there's a lot of counterfeit out there. Do you have a, a method or something to tell people so they can even figure out if something is a commercial grade non-honey honey, honey? Uh, or is I that just say, too broad yeah, i mean um i always say if you've had a jar of honey on your shelf for four years and it hasn't crystallized <laughs> chances are 
you know, it's, it's not guaranteed, but, you know, because um, I think the whole people wanting, uh, maybe it's less so in the States, but Australian public is, is in the process of being re-educated that honey, um, one, uh, the value of honey. So to your point, if, you know, if it's cheap and it's honey, like honey is a lot of work by beekeepers and bees to create a tiny little jar of honey. Right. And then for it to get from the hive through to your store is mm. more like you, you need to have, you need to be expect to pay a certain amount of money for the, for, for those jars. Mm. Um, but on top of that, um, if you look at honey and it's starting to crystallize or, you know, don't take it back to the store and say something's wrong with it. Like you should right. be proud. Yeah. It's actually the other way. Something's right with it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, those people who've, you know, so, so I always say, don't be frightened of the natural process of, of honey, because it's, it's something that's actually, you know, you'd be like, phew, good. And, you know, if, if that's not your preference for taste, warm it up. But as far as counterfeit, I mean, we had um, a massive uh, sort of controversy here with one of our major packers a few years back who was labeling honey, uh, Australian and it was very cheap on the supermarket shelves and it turns out again under the analysis someone did a review and they were bringing in imported honey from China but they were also um, the imported honey they were bringing in was adulterated with sugar syrup to your point mm-hmm. um, it, it got a lot of press here and it was um, so damaging for that company that um, the, the rules and the, the regulations on honey in Australia is so high now um, the major packers and the major supermarkets, um, they need to, if you're labeling something, you need to make sure that, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. And it's also Accurate. the country of origin is true. Yeah. Um, but the, to be honest, like, you know, there's the, the big packers in Australia, like Beechworth Honey or Penin- Pure Peninsula, um, they, the good thing about those companies is they don't just only sell Australian honey. They also, um, pay beekeepers a fair price and I think it's not just about counterfeit it's about rewarding beekeepers for the work that goes in it and not trying to undercut them Mm -hmm. so yeah there's there's not just there's two sides to that coin so one is for the customers but one is also supporting those beekeepers because particularly in Australia when we've had extreme weather of huge fires and droughts and and, um, floods um the beekeepers here, they do it tough, like really tough. So um, the, those packers, um, hats off to them. They're doing everything they can to make sure that the, the livelihood of those beekeepers continues. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so I think there's, and that's part of the education piece for customers as well. Like don't buy it because it's, you know, $5. <laughs> so which $5 right. is actually, yeah. you. you should pay more because it's not just, your, your product but you're supporting that that infrastructure and I think there's a lot of attention around farm to fork but also the work that's gone in to get get it there people need to appreciate the value mm-hmm. no I totally agree with everything you just said let's see how about honey that ages does you know the older it gets do you find the flavors are altered can I mean I have a honey from a friend. She um, has a, a goat farm in New South Wales in like northern New South, like sort of just out north of Sydney. And um, her, it was, she's inherited it from her father, but her father also, she keeps bees and her father also keeps bees and they do beautiful cheeses. She found some tins that were stored correctly of honey um, that is 60 years old. Mm-hmm that she'd been sitting there the whole time that she didn't know what to do with. So she jarred it up and she said, this is genuine vintage, genuine limited edition vintage honey um, that I bought some of. Um, so as far as honey aging, this is, this is the oldest honey I've ever eaten. And it was um, black, like it was really, really dark. And um, because all, all honey darkens with age, is that right? Yeah, yeah, it does. But it's also the taste. Um, it would have been, I'd imagine, it would have been mixed sort of meadow slash, you know, some some crops that, you know, they might have had some fruit trees or something. So it would have just been a sort of blossom, general blossom honey. 
Um, but it was so, the flavor had become so rich as well. So there, there was one, the color, but it was, um, it was almost treacle. And uh, I was going to say, you could tell it was honey. Like it wasn't totally like treacle, but it was, it was sort of going down that molasses, that, that richness. That what's it, that it had, word? I'm sorry. What's the word you're using? Treacle. Treacle, treacle, treacle. which is British, but it's more like molasses, I think. What's that? Do you call it? That, that I have dark... no idea what you're talking about right now. Okay. <laughs> it's, Tre it's trickle? Tre treacle. 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 Spell yeah, it. which is uh, T-R-E-A-C-L-E, -E, which I believe yeah. is like molasses. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like molasses. So you think it would have, so if that's what it was, that would not be honey from bees. Oh, no, no, no. But it had those characteristics. It had the flavors was, of, it, of something that would not have been from bees. Yeah. But, but it was from it bees. It was from bees. And the only reason it, it tasted like that was from the, from the aging process over 60 years. It, the, it just, the sugars caramelized. And I don't know what, what happened. But um, again, I'm not an expert on aging honey. But I took it to my advanced class. Yeah. to the, the trains in Italy and they said the same thing you did it's true to a very old honey it should be really dark um and they were really curious about the flavor as well and they said yeah it's it's just that the flavors have evolved into something that's very rich okay so we said evolved not devolved so evolved does that mean it's better <laughs> no does that mean it's was it better or does it is it just a unique flavor did you like it did you like um, well, the taste of it? We're not allowed to, as sommeliers say, it's good or we like it or don't like it. Um, if I, so we, when you do honey tasting, you have to, even ones that I personally would not prefer, you mm -hmm. have to describe how the, the, the character. So I, I enjoyed it and I could see why, where you could use it. It would be really good for pairing or for recipes or for certain um, things like that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to sit there and eat it with a spoon <laughs> as, as I would something like a clover or, um, you know, it wasn't sort of like, oh, I'm going to have another spoon of that. Um, but I could see its place in, in the spectrum of honeys. Okay. Now that's, you touched on something there. So let's say you, you like, they give you a sample of honey that is really off putting to you personally, but you still have to describe it. Um, yeah. How did you, just give me your worst honey tasting experience and then what the description was. Okay. So the worst one was when I did my first foundation course and um, it's a honey from Italy called Arbutus from the Arbutus tree, which is strawberry tree. Um, it's delicacy. A lot of Southern Italians love it. They, um, they really crave it. It is extremely bitter, like to the point you put your spoon in and the bitterness can be so overpowering, but I hadn't prepared myself for it and was, you know, I think I was a bit honey drunk. I think I've had about like 20 honeys. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, we like, you know, got that spoon, put it in. And I was like trying to be all, I was like, like, you know, like in the cartoons, your, your eyes spin and you have... Yeah like um steam coming out of your, your ears it was a bit like that and then um I couldn't I couldn't taste honey for the rest of the afternoon it was really? so overpowering so all and the all the elbow sniffing and everything wouldn't work I was still you were, had that, you were done that bitterness my whole mouth was like oh, you violated your taste buds what have you done so um yeah that's so then what was your it. yeah so what was your description then and so I'm you're be yeah, all it's composed very much... and like like you're trying to get somebody else to taste it so don't disclose yeah. that it's going to blow them out of their chair and so what's your description of that well I did I do remember having it I was trying to be cool and then the girl next to me she's from California and she she did the same and she looked at me and she goes why didn't you tell me and I was like I couldn't speak <laughs> so there was it was a bit like that in the whole room but um it's very, and we've got one that um, a friend of mine, she's got apiaries on Kangaroo Island here, uh, which is a, actually a bee sanctuary for Ligurian bees. So um, it's it's so far from the mainland that the bees can't inter intermingle mm -hmm. with other um, colonies. But they also, um, 
biosecurity and the customers is massive. So they've, you know, so they've, they're very, got an amazing sort of ecosystem on Kangaroo Island. But um, she has a honey that after the last bushfires, a lot of the, the trees that the bees normally forage on had been just decimated. They were taken away. Um, so the bees were forced to forage on um, a thing called pig face, which is um, like a coastal flower that comes almost like a succulent on the beach. Yeah, it's called pig face um, and that had a similar characteristics. So um, yeah, pig face honey <laughs> is uh, not as bitter as strawberry tree, but pig face honey is, um, it has those, and it, when you talk about descriptors for a honey like that, that like these ones is, um, it's very quinine or quinine, I don't know how you pronounce it, you know, like that, that, that flavour, but also it's like um, biting into um, a green stalk of a, of a plant like not a not of a veg but one that you'd eat but like if you'd bitten into like maybe an aloe or something or it was very sort of it's it's very green very green notes but also but but there's a bitterness to it as if you bite into a um a plant that shouldn't be eaten sort of time did you ever have you ever eaten a dandelion stem no that's bitter so i mean i wouldn't know that's what i'm told that if you bite a yeah. dandelion stem yeah, but, it, but again, it has a bitter of, flavor, but supposedly it's edible, but you know. Yeah, so you're not going to die, which is always handy. <laughs> that is good. That's that's at the top of the list of things to not do when sampling honey. So we did age. Your favorite, your overall favorite is what? If you had to pick one uh, honey. My overall favorite. Okay, I, I am a sucker for an Italian acacia. Um, because it has that vanilla marshmallow and just it is like just eating candy floss like but in a just the best way so um, I do love that but um, from a local honey here um, I'm a massive fan of banksia so banksia honey here is um, it, like sort of it has it's, it's caramel but malty and it is like a warm hug in in your mouth so it's it's just it's a just... warm hug in your mouth okay. yeah <laughs> and what's you in it you it. said it's a banksia can you spell banksia. it banksia yeah it's a beautiful native australian flower and um that honey is it's actually not hard to come by so um would you, know, you spell that please for yeah of course b a n k s i a and if you Google the picture of the flower, the flower's gorgeous. The flower's just beautiful. Yeah, I've seen I've seen that uh, graffiti on the walls in London by Banksy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you you get it's Banksy, I know, but it's yeah, no, because I lived in, I lived in I lived in London too, so I get I get that on both sides. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay, we already did that temperature matter. Oh. Because we're getting near the end because we've been talking for how long have we been talking? Anyway, um, so for people that want to learn, there are no online courses. Is that right? They have to go. Uh, I believe that they could do the research. I believe Marina does. Um, well, she did do uh, during lockdown um, some online courses. Um, but I'm, I haven't, last time I checked, they, they hadn't started up again. Same, and I think there was more of a pivot um, because of the lockdowns. However, I am about to start um, some online courses. Is it called Honey Merchant? Yes. Oh my gosh, I just made that up right now. <laughs> Please, Jess, tell us about Honey Merchant. So Honey Merchant, I just needed... You know, I, I didn't know what I was going to do with these skills, but I needed a, a sort of, you know, a name or something that to start producing the content and sort of channeling it through. Um, so Honey Merchant is um, my, um, what I do a lot of my education or my tasting notes through. Um, so I've, I do a lot of work. Um, well, I've been more active in social media, like mainly Instagram but uh, I also am about to start doing an online course with Australian honeys um, and I'm going to be sending out packs and mm. um, 
as long as you are in an area that can um, receive honey. So for example, in Australia, some states, you can't, even internally, you can't send honey. So Western Australia, mm -hmm. if someone joined in from Perth, um, I couldn't send them the box of honey. So, but potentially if I have, yeah. Why is that? Is it, uh, does uh, the, that could be in the honey or? Oh, it's biosecurity. Bio it's pure biosecurity. Yeah, so they, um, uh, it's customs, they, um, uh, honey is, um, they've got such unique forests and um, bees like for the Jara um, forest and things like that, they just can't afford any um, pests or disease to come through from maybe some mm. of the other states. And we have a lot of that around Australia, particularly with, um, like you can't take grape products down to the Mornington Peninsula because we've got such a huge winery, like, you know, the, the wine business. So there's certain, um, even bringing um, fruit and veg into Australia is obviously very strict, but even within Australia ourselves, um, across state borders, depending on what um, their agriculture or their industry is, it's, it, there's also rules. Mm. Um, however, Melbourne, I live in the best place because you can send honey to Victoria <laughs> from overseas or from anywhere. So mm -hmm. I can get honeys in, I can send honeys out. So as long as somebody is in a place that can receive honey, um, uh, I could send them and they could join my online honey tasting for Australian honeys. Okay. And for those that are watching or listening podcast, you can <laughs> uh, find these links will be down in the video description. So people can follow that to your Instagram and also to your primary website. So that will be down there also. Beautiful. Uh, what are some honey terms that everyone should know? Uh, terroir. What is, I should never have asked that question. <laughs> what is, what is that? Terroir is the, is basically, and it's the same as wine in a sense that, um, it's the whole idea that the, the environment around that uh, ha, around where the, the product has been made has influenced its flavor. Mm. So, uh, for example, with wine, depending on the soil or the temperature or, you know, the, the air that comes in, like that will influence the flavor of the grapes, which in turn influences the flavor of the, the wine. So with honey tasting, it's similar. It's sort of, um, you know, you are tasting the journey of the bees. So um, the, the where if you buy a, a red gum honey from, um, and this is like, again, we're not looking at the Italian version where they go deep on the analysis of the pollen and making sure it's all identical. Mm -hmm. But if you buy um, a red gum honey from, uh, you know, New South Wales, and then you also buy one from Victoria, the flavours will be influenced by the terroir, where, whether it be, um, you know, the landscape around, um, the other flowers that are in bloom at the time, the, the, the you know, the season that it was harvested in, you know, it will mm. really influence the flavour. Um, so I think it's always mindful. Um, you know, a friend of mine, she um gave me some honey that she'd harvested in Gippsland. And when I tasted it, it was, it had um, some honeys are, are very true to what they, what they come from. So for example, blackberry honey, if you have honey that's um, your bees are foraged on um, sort of the blackberry bushes or the wild blackberries, um, it has a slight cassis um, flavor that comes through that sort of, you know, that sort of blackberry liqueur, like there's a, there's a sweetness mm. and a berryness that comes through. Some honeys don't taste anything like the, the plant or, or, or what they come through, but some do. So blackberry is one of them. Almond, almond honey is one of them. Almond, um, you can detect notes of that, the marzipan coming through. And everyone mm. knows orange blossom. Orange blossom smells like a field of, you know, citrus plants in bloom. Like it's a, you, you, those, those fruity floral notes come, come through. So mm. um so yeah, so the terroir is really important. So the honey that she gave me, um, I could, yeah, I, I was like, where did you harvest this? And she goes, oh, up near the, where the cows are, you know, sort of in Gippsland. I was like, tastes like blackberry. She goes, there was like the blackberries, the black, you know, it was, it was spring or whenever it was. And um, she said she'd noticed a lot of blackberry um, brambles sort of coming through. So 
you know, when you taste honey, you taste the journey of those bees and you, you can taste the flavors of the area that it's been harvested from, which I think is really beautiful. It is. That's really interesting, actually. And I know I have to ask this question because somebody watching is going to wonder, um, are there different lines of bees that have an impact on the flavor of the honey? Yes. So um, there is, in a sense, well, in Australia, well, we're, they're not allowed to call it honey because of the moisture content, but we have honeybees. So whether it be Ligurian or, or, you know, traditional honeybees like Caucasian, Italian, like, you know, we, mm -hmm. we have honeybees. Um, but we also have our native bees, our native stingless bees, um, mm -hmm. the sugar bag bees, and you can buy honey from those bees, but the, 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 the moisture content is a lot higher. Um, so technically because of that, they're not allowed to, you know, there's controversy around calling it honey because of the, mm -hmm. the water content of it. Um, and the way it's harvested, the uh, literally is so manual. Um, for the beekeeper has to have like a, a syringe and has to go in and pull out the nectar or the honey from each of the individual cells. And it doesn't even look like a, a beehive that you would traditionally see. It's in a box and it's like, it's like a swirl of. Yeah. Um, yeah. it almost looks like the Guggenheim uh, museum. Yeah. 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 But that honey um, does taste different and it mainly tastes different because the way that the bees create that honey, um, mm. even though they're foraging on the same things as the traditional honey bees, and it, it, it tastes a lot more fermented, like you've got to keep it in the fridge or it will ferment. It's, right. it's more of the, the sourness that comes through. Hmm. That's really interesting too. Any final thoughts, final statement that you'd like to make? uh support <laughs> local, support local bees where you can um yeah keep supporting local bees and local honey um and experiment go, like don't don't go and buy what you know just because you th you think that's that's honey honey doesn't taste like honey honey tastes like anything it could be anything um ranging from there's a south african honey that smells like um a cafe latte like it's sort of like milky coffee and there's yeah, there's, <laughs> there's some that taste like, you know, candy and some that taste like, you know, as we said, buckwheat to me is, um, you know, Black Forest Gateau, like, you know, it's, and then there's such a spectrum of flavors to honey. Be brave, experiment and um, you know, start your own honey collection from whether it be you as a foodie wanting to collect the flavors or you as a beekeeper um, wanting to keep note of the different flavors in your area. I think it's all in, really important to just, yeah, no, take more notice. That's fantastic. I wanna thank you so much for spending your time with me and for sharing all this great information and kind of inspiring people maybe to look deeper into their honey and have a deeper experience. So I hope uh, everything there goes great and that your good health continues. And I wish you the best with your business. So thank you very much, Fred. Yep. Thank you so much, Jess. It's been a oh, pleasure. Yep, same here. So as an afterthought, I quickly asked Jess about Kiva raw manuka honey. Why is it so expensive? An 8.8 .8 ounce jar currently sells on Amazon for $102.60. That's 250 grams. Let's talk more. So Jess, a lot of people look at what they consider to be high dollar, high value honeys. For example, Manuka honey, what's the big deal? What do you tell people that ask you about it? Uh, with Manuka, it's, it's interesting. And it's it, because when, as we spoke about before, it's like that, that awareness and that education about honey, they know about honey and then they know about Manuka and they know Manuka is more expensive. Um, in their mind, they, they, they've heard it's better, but I stop and I say to them, why, why, why? Tell, you tell me why you think Manuka is better. They're going, oh, but it's it's better for you and it's more expensive, so it must be better for you. And it's like, okay, well, you do know, like, you know, the Manuka is a type of leptospernum and the reason why it's more expensive is because the higher the, you know, 
the antimicrobial property of it, you know, and they look at me with like their eyes bulging out. They go, no, 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 I didn't know any of that. I just know that, you know, it's it's good because they've I've, I've read it in the media or I've heard about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I tell them that all honey has microbiome, <laughs> like micro antimicrobial properties and what they, and I said, also ask them, which always makes me laugh. What do you do with your Manuka honey that, that really gets you to put your hand in your pocket? It's like, well, when I'm sick, I have honey and lemon drinks with my Manuka. And I said, so how do you make that? <laughs> I think I get boiling water. I put my Manuka honey in it. I'm just yeah. like, ah. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, there's, Manuka is um, great, but I don't think there's an, uh, people buy it to your point because, They've heard it's good. They don't understand why it's good. But if they actually worked out that there's there's a wide variety of plants in the Leptospermum family that all have high antimicrobial properties, um, they, they could save their money. There's one in the Northern Rivers here. Um, and I personally, you know, I'm not allowed to say a, a honey is good or bad tasting, but I personally, Manuka honey is not a flavor I would enjoy myself. Um, it's a little bit more savory. Um, but there's a honey from the Northern Rivers called Jelly Bush, which is um, uh, literally, if you if you hold it up against the light, it has almost like chunks of jelly. It's very, um, is it thixotropic? Or I, I can't think of the word, um, but it's it has this um, chunks. But it, it's it's another one that's a really, really, if you want honey that's got a high antimicrobial properties, that's it's it's incredible it's very medicinal honey and it actually tastes a lot nicer and it's more fun because it's got chunks of jelly in it Hmm. i know which one i'd buy (laughs) now is yeah and is that the stuff that almost because it won't flow right you almost have to vibrate it out yeah and you mentioned flow hive before there's certain honey um that That plugs it up yeah um manuka is one of them because it's very it's very thick. Um, jelly bush, they struggle with as well because, um, yeah, it, 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 it does, it is so thick and it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not as fluid as a lot of honeys. Mm. So is, Manuka is the world's most expensive honey, isn't it? Yeah, but, um, you know, and it's also, I think, is it because of, you um, the the work and the the rarity that goes into it and the work the rarity of the honey or is it a marketing ploy i think it's a little little i've never even had it i've never tasted it because i'm you know i'm financially embarrassed and i live in the country and i can't afford (laughs) manuka honey but it comes up all the time celebrated for its medicinal properties as you described uh, which is attainable in a lot of other varieties of honey but people are willing to pay for the perception of value and also, um, the, the, there's the perception of value, but also if you if you're pay, paying for it to be more medicinal than other honeys, what are you using it for that you can actually get value from those medicinal properties? Yeah. And, and nine times out of ten, putting it, you know putting it on your cereal um, or putting it in boiling water, which kills the anti like, kills the right, goodness. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It is just yeah. people. People. Um, some people really um i think a good example as well is we had um during the bushfires there was a problem with a lot of wildlife that that was came in injured and i'm part of some um, beekeeping groups here that they had an amnesty on any beekeepers that had surplus honey could they please donate it for the animals Mm -hmm. Um, and what they were doing is they were putting honey from any any honey that had come directly from a hive and what wasn't processed onto the wounds of these burnt animals to help heal them. So with that in mind, the the medicinal property of honey, um, any honey is there. Um, And it's really, you know, if you're paying for it because you enjoy it, amazing. If you're paying for it because you really want those extra qualities and you're celebrating those extra qualities, amazing. But I think a lot of people do buy it because they know they've heard it's good, but they don't really know why it's good or what they you know, what that trigger is for them. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting food for thought. <laughs> well, thanks for recapping that then. So that's good. And now we're finished for real. Okay. <laughs> okay. Amazing. Okay. Thanks Jen so much. And there you have it. Another interview with an expert. 
and thank you for spending your time with us. It was a pleasure to host Jessica Lacanini, and you may now be inspired to know more about becoming a honey sommelier. Please reference the links provided in the video description, and you can access the entire interview series at thewaytobe.org. I'm Frederick Dunn, wishing you all the best in beekeeping.